on this episode of Postcards. We're able to show really amazing work that is screening in Boston and New York, and our neighbors in Renshaw, Minnesota can experience that as well. There's just something magical about seeing a movie in a barn. Ripless is an interesting way to think about our own mortality and how we hope people will remember us. I always have fun crafting the story and it's just kind of fun to see it come to life on set. Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. On the web at shalomhillfarm.org. Alexandria, Minnesota a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage-funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota, on the web at lrac4calendar.org. Playing today's new music plus your favorite hits, 96.7 Cram, online at 967cram.com. So this barn is the home of the Free Range Film Festival, which we started doing in 2004 because we had a lot of friends who made movies and they didn't have a great venue to screen their films. So we thought it would be fun to turn this barn into a movie theater and then have a film festival inside of it. That first year we thought, well, we'll get maybe like 30 people to come to this. You know, it's in the middle of nowhere in northern Minnesota, and we had 300. The barn was built in 1916, and the whole place was farmed for quite some time. The barn was used first as a horse barn, then as a cow barn, and now it's a film barn. Seeing that kind of architecture is just so amazing. You don't see wood beams that big anymore. So it's sort of fun too, because if there's a movie that maybe you aren't so into, you can just stare at the ceiling and sort of wonder about what we can do as humans. There's just something magical about seeing a movie in a barn. Over the years, we just gradually transformed it into a movie theater, like an actual theater with an actual movie theater screen and movie theater speakers and a few movie theater chairs, um, but most of the chairs actually come from a, a junior high school that was torn down. The thing I like about film festivals is even if you have uh, an art house cinema in your town, I mean, they're, they're still gonna play fairly close to mainstream films. The nice thing about a film festival is you get a huge mix of really outsider, uh, experimental films, animation, documentaries, unclassifiable things. You just get a nice 
potpourri of films that you don't see anywhere else. I mean, Netflix isn't playing a lot of short films or experimental things. I mean, it's just hard to find that stuff unless you go down these rabbit holes on YouTube and then, you know, who knows what you're gonna find there. We get about 200 films submitted every year and we watch them in the middle of winter, you know, when it's cold and um, you can kind of stay inside for a while watching movies. And um, we just, we want to show movies that delight us, that we find surprising, that we find might have a different voice that we might not normally see. So for instance, we're showing this afternoon a movie from Iran about processed meats. And I have no idea about the culture behind processed meat sandwiches in Iran. And this filmmaker did an amazing job of really connecting you to the people um, that, that he loves and cares about. And so you have that personal human connection. <laughs> Basically, we just have to love it. And I think knowing and trusting that if we love it, our audiences are going to love it too. And I think what I'm really proud of with the festival is that we've been able to cultivate a connection with filmmakers. We're able to show really amazing work that is screening in Boston and New York and San Francisco and our neighbors in Renshaw, Minnesota can experience that as well. My favorite thing about the festival is when someone new shows up who's never been here before. And we take them up the stairs and they see the, the hayloft that kind of looks like a giant overturned Viking ship above your head. And it's this like cathedral of agriculture, I guess, but we've turned it into a, a cathedral to cinema. And I, I love that. Isn't it weird to have beanbaggers behind me when I'm... You can't really see it. It's more of the trees. It is. Okay. All right. That's fine. I'm sorry. I'm overproducing this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Mike Schultz, and I directed a film called Ripplist. This man will be dead within a couple months. Jimmy Superfly Snooka. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Yeah, he's supposedly clock in hospice. Is, uh, clock's ticking. Clock is ticking. Yep. He's circling the drain. John picked him this year, but he didn't die yet, so. And it's about a celebrity death pool. Um, it's a documentary, so I actually followed real human beings who engage in this morbid, tasteless behavior of, of drafting celebrities that they think might die in the next year. And then sort of like vultures circle around these people waiting for them to die so that they can score a point. I'm just really trying to make it so I don't sound really insensitive. Because, you know, I mean, nobody really wants anybody to die, but some of these celebrities just hang on way too long. That's kind of what initially interested me in the film. I just thought it was so inappropriate. Um, but then I started talking to them, and a lot of them are, you know, classic film buffs, and they genuinely admire the people that they're, you know, waiting on to die. You know, they're happy when Jerry Lewis dies, but they also spend a lot of time talking about Jerry Lewis's career and, and what he meant to people, and, you know, thinking about his level of fame and, how, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so it's kind of oddly sweet in a way after I started looking at it a bit more. I, I think maybe the majority of people are disgusted by it, but I also think that the majority of people are curious about it. First and foremost, we're a, we're a fun social group and we're really honoring these people. Who wakes up every day and thinks, I wonder how Olivia de Havilland is doing today? We do. We ask these questions of ourselves constantly. How is she today? Is she fine? 
Is she worth drafting? If she's not worth drafting, which I don't think she is, I think she's got five more years in her, her family lives a long time, then I'm gonna leave her alone and wish her a nice day. I know people who don't wanna talk about anything. They don't wanna talk about funeral arrangements. They don't wanna talk about healthcare directives. It's like, dude, you are gonna die. Like, you could die tomorrow. You could die in 10 minutes. Like, why? It's going to happen. I'm very passionate about it. I'll take uh, King Michael of Romania. Mac Wiseman, a member of the Country Music Hall of Fame. It's a long shot, but I'm going to go with Richard Simmons. Something uh -oh. is up with Richard Simmons. I am going to um, pick Bob Shane, S-H-A-N-E. He's the only surviving original Kingston trio. Oh. But who isn't, who isn't interested in death? Death is something we all should be interested in, but death is something we, as human beings, are taught never to think about. There have rarely been any days that have gone by in my life that I haven't thought about what it's going to feel like when that moment comes. Well, now here I am 70 years old. And now I really am not only wondering, I'm kind of fearful of what it might be like when that time comes. It goes back a long time. I think a lot of it has to do with when I was growing up in Kentucky and on what we called Decoration Day, we would always go to the cemetery where all our relatives were buried over the last 150 years or so, and we would have a picnic in the cemetery. Some people would find that extremely morbid today and wouldn't dare do it. But to me, it makes logical sense to be there with those who have gone before. So uh, I'm gonna spoil a little bit of the ending of the film. One of the last things I do in the film is I ask uh, the, the, the celebrity death poolers in the Rip List um, what they think happens to them when they die. And I get all these really interesting answers. This rip list is an interesting way to think about our own mortality and how we hope people will remember us. So it was just a kind of a sideways way for me to approach the, the topic of death in um, an unusual way. Good morning. What can I get you? Just coffee, please. Okay. And what to eat? Yeah, I'm good with just the coffee. You're pretty early for just coffee, aren't you? Sure I can't interest you in some eggs or something? Hank whips up a mean pair of scrambled. Mm, just coffee, please. Coffee it is. Here is your coffee, freshly brewed. Thank you. I'll be back to check on you in a minute. Okay. See if I can't change your mind about those eggs. So what's the deal with that guy? What guy? The coffee guy. Gerald. Oh, you on a first name basis with him now? Well, he's been here five hours. It was bound to come up by the eighth trip over there. So what's his deal? No deal, he's just drinking coffee. Exactly, just coffee. 
for five hours. Yeah, it's a little odd, but he's just some old guy probably has nowhere else to go. So when are you gonna cut him off? Why would I cut him off? Refills are free. Well, you better hope Frank doesn't find out. More coffee? Oh, yes, please, thank you. Oh, Marie. Yes, Frank. Want me to turn on a light or something? Who is that man? That's Gerald. Gerald. Yep. He's eating a sandwich. What? He's eating a sandwich. I need you to ask him to leave. Yeah, but... Or outside food, you know the rules. When have we ever enforced that? When have we ever had to? Look, just leave him alone. He's a harmless old man. I've been watching him. Just how many cups of coffee has he had? About ten. And how much have you charged him? Two dollars. For ten cups? Our sign says free refills. What could I do? Charge him more! <sighs> Frank... Look, just get rid of him. Now, or those cups and then some are coming out of your paycheck. You can't do that. Marie, <clears throat> let me let you in on a little secret. This whole assistant manager thing, it's temporary. Kathy's been talking about moving me up very soon. And when she does, you better believe some things will change. And the first thing, no more free refills. Now, do you know what the second thing will be? No. Well, go cut them off or you're gonna find out. What if he's homeless? What if I'm throwing some homeless guy out in the cold when all he wanted was a quiet place to sit and some coffee? Marie, it's like 55 degrees outside. Yeah, but that's like 12 degrees Celsius. And when have you ever cared what Frank thinks? He's just the assistant manager, and Kathy wouldn't mind. Because he said if I serve him anymore, he's gonna take it out of my salary. Then don't serve him anymore. serving him then? Everyone. What do you mean, everyone? Let me make one thing perfectly clear. No one is to serve that man anymore. Understood? He has had his last cup of coffee. You got 18 cups! As far as tonight is concerned, we are out of coffee. And you, I told you to get rid of it. Go, you're done for the day. But I need this shift. I don't want to hear it. And don't bother coming in tomorrow either. You're firing me? Consider it a light suspension. I'll see you Monday, night shift. I, I can't work that shift, you know that. My kids... will have a great time with their babysitter, I'm sure. Get him out of here, now. But... I promised him one last refill. Fine, you can serve him one more and get him out of here. One more? Oh yeah, baby, that's me, 19. Everybody pay up, come on. Thank you. I can't afford this right now. I need this job, I need these hours. Hey, don't worry, honey. We'll talk to Kathy. Anyway, I'm sure Hank would be willing to share his money with you. Hell no, I got bills too. Well, hold up. Maybe Marie doesn't want you to win. Maybe we don't leave it at 19. 
What do you say? You want to serve him? Yeah. Let's serve him one more time. Alone, oh, Frank. you better believe I'm gonna deal with you next, Missy. But you, get out. Pay your tab and get out of my restaurant before I take that book and... <clears throat> Miss Reynolds! Oh, that, I, I was just... Uh... What's going on here, Frank? Oh, well, you see, he kept ordering coffee, and I asked them to stop serving him. Why? Because they were giving him free refills. Refills are free. I know, but... Is this what I can expect if I make you manager? No, ma'am, I, I... I don't want to hear it. I want to see you in my office. But first, you need to apologize to this man, and then I want you, personally, to continue to wait on him until he decides to leave. Yes, ma'am. I, um, would like to apologize for my behavior. Uh, if there's anything that I can do to make it up to you. Some more coffee, perhaps? No, I think I've had enough coffee for today. I'll, uh, just pay my bill and be on my way. Oh, and, uh, would you see that the young lady who served me earlier gets this? I'd hate to have her think I'm stiff. Give a more satisfying sight. Yep, and it just walked in. Coffee. Oh, no, no, no. Lunch today. What's your soup of the day? Soup. Sounds delicious. I'll take one. I thought you'd like to know. Crackers are complimentary.
My name is Matthew Dressel and I'm the writer and director of Just Coffee. The idea for Just Coffee basically came from just the fact that I drink a lot of coffee. Um, I love to go to diners, it's one of my favorite things to do. Whenever I'm out on the road, I always have to find a diner. It always has to be a kitschy, out of the way, greasy spoon, and I just like to drink coffee. And I always wondered, am I upsetting these people? Am I drinking too much coffee? And I just thought, what would happen if I just sat here the whole day and I drank? I worked with uh, an entirely Minnesotan crew. Basically, I wanted to use as many of the people in my area as I could. But it was really important to me that I utilize the filmmaking community that's already in Duluth. One of the interesting things that was going on was we were constantly trying to battle a carnival that was happening outside. It was uh, one of the more difficult things on set was just the fact that when you're on set, you need it to be quiet and you need to be able to hear the actors. And we had rock bands and parades and games and all this stuff happening right outside the door uh, for the entire weekend that we were shooting. My favorite part of the film is in somewhere towards the middle when the manager storms out of his office and then there's this long tracking shot down the entirety of the diner. Whenever I start with a film, I always have at least one or two shots that I just need in there. And when I was looking for locations, I needed that long, diner type of counter that we could go across and it just basically it just gives you a nice view of everything all the people and everything in there and I just I like how it all came together go, 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 go. my main thing that I like to do is pit two forces against each other or to have some type of series of events happen that spirals out of control that the main character has to fix or something like that. I really, I'm primarily a screenwriter at heart, so the, the story is always the most important thing to me. So I always have fun crafting the story and it's just kind of fun to see it come to life on set. Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. On the web at shalomhillfarm.org. Alexandria, Minnesota, a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota. On the web at lrac4calendar.org. Playing today's new music plus your favorite hits, 96.7 Cram. Online at 96.7cram.com.